We're here today at the Age Management um, Medicine Conference in Las Vegas, and we're delighted to have the opportunity to interview Dr. Cesar Pellerano. Thank you very much. Did I get that right? Got it Excellent. Right. Cesar is a cardiologist. He's actually focused on optimal health and preventative cardiology. His goal would be to keep you from getting heart disease. So, Cesar, I understand today your topic is going to be testosterone and its actions on the heart which obviously is a very important topic, particularly in light of the recent FDA ruling and advisory board and all the hullabaloo of, over a number of papers in the past year. I'd love to hear more about it. That's correct. Um, you know, the famous article that created this whole problem was the JAMA article that came out last year. And as a consequence, that's created kind of a media frenzy and a lot of confusion, not only to the public, but also to, in the medical community. That article was terribly flawed, and there were a lot of m mistakes that were made that even the authors acknowledged to. However, like everything else, a lot of times, whatever comes out first, that's what people stick to, just like pacemakers. People still ask me about, hey, how about a pacemaker and the microwave oven, and that hasn't been a, a problem since 1977. Mm -hmm. So the purpose today is to present to the audience what data is out there really about all of the effects of testosterone on the heart. And when we look at the big volume of data, it is all beneficial. And the amount of detrimental information is virtually negligible. In addition, this has created a problem in that many, many medical communities throughout the world are now asking JAMA for a retraction of the article. So that's also in the works. So hopefully today I'll be able to clear the air a little bit for people about the use of testosterone, how safe it is, and also how they need to screen the patients in order for them to use the testosterone safely. I think that's an important point, and um, I myself am biased because, after all, the heart's a muscle, and muscle needs testosterone. I think the issue backs into the direct-to-consumer marketing and the concern that prescriptions are written all the time. I think it's up to a $2 billion industry, but yet patients are really not worked up, nor are they followed adequately. And maybe that is because doctors like you and I are part of this Age Management Medicine Conference, and we're learning about this information, and we're sharing it with our colleagues. We're interested in approaching patients to get them to optimal health in the right way, yet that access to information isn't out there as readily. What would you say a physician should do to p do a workup correctly and then monitor a patient? Well, absolutely, what you said is true. And I think a lot of the problems with testosterone is that the, a lot of the administration of testosterone out there is really done by people who aren't trained in how to use it, also people who are um, using it in a somewhat shady manner, and um, it's really not medically supervised. But if a doctor becomes trained in how to use testosterone, it doesn't require a lot of training. Number one, they need to screen their patients from the cardiovascular standpoint, okay? You need to make sure that what are the risk factors? Do they have a family history of heart disease? Do they have metabolic syndrome? In other words, do they have abdominal fat? Do they have insulin resistance? Do they have hyperlipidemia? And when we look at the testosterone effect on the metabolic syndrome, it is totally positive. Every single aspect of the metabolic syndrome is improved by the use of testosterone. So when we look at all of the risk factors that we have in coronary disease, sure, testosterone doesn't affect your family history, doesn't affect the smoking history, but it does affect everything else, and it's always in a positive manner. So if doctors are able to use the testosterone but monitor the improvement of the patients, I think it would be much safer for everyone. I agree. In fact, there was just a publication that I read about this morning just came out looking at the high risk of low testosterone in type 2 diabetes because of the effect that testosterone has on maintaining lean muscle and also immobilizing and clearing sugar. So I think that you're on the right track here. What are the issues that you might want to warn doctors to be on the lookout for in terms of risks once you initiate testosterone treatment? I think the single biggest risk is the elevation of the hemoglobin and hematocrit. 
in the patient that may or may not have a cardiovascular event. And this is where I think we get into problems when testosterone is administered by doctors who are not following the patient. What you said about diabetes is absolutely true. And I don't know if you know, but the very first report of this was in 1978, how testosterone improves diabetes. And since then, we've had over 20 articles talking about how testosterone improves diabetes. But the thing is, none of this positive stuff gets published in the media because it's not juicy. All right, so what do people need to look for? Number one, you wanna make sure that the patient doesn't have a big substrate for cardiovascular disease because testosterone is gonna do a lot of positive things for the patient, but also it's gonna make him behave a little bit differently than before. So maybe someone who wasn't sexually active becomes more sexually active. Maybe someone who wasn't exercising now starts to exercise. So when we see those changes in people, all of which are positive, you also wanna make sure that they can safely do the exercise and they can safely do all of these activities. So the actual screening of the patient from the point of view of maybe having an exercise test, looking at their lipids, there's really no cook book, you really need to do, look at the patient as an individual. But the screening should be done. But the single most important factor is going to be following that hemoglobin and hematocrit in the cardiac patient because you really don't want this going very high and maybe causing a problem. Exactly. So when the hemoglobin and hematocrit increase, it's because of the effect that testosterone has on the red blood cells and generating new red blood cells. And there what we're looking at is perhaps the issue of uh, thick blood and blood that could clog. And so some of the other issues I think we talked about before are perhaps making sure that nutrient levels are adequate. For example, the B vitamins, B12, and a person perhaps doesn't have a risk of an elevated homocysteine and with a genetic defect of MTHFR that would allow for an increased risk of thrombo, um, thrombosis, um, deep vein thrombosis, and potentially heart disease. So I think just getting a regular CBC and Absolutely. keeping track of it and perhaps doing iatrogenic phlebotomies where, or donating unit blood. That's correct. And I have a magic number. I tell everybody, do not have your hemoglobin above 17. If you're hitting 17, you should donate blood. And that's kind of like a rule of thumb that I've made up in my office. And as soon as my patients reach 17, they go to phlebotomy because I really don't want them getting any higher because that is really the number one risk. The other thing is you talked about nutrition and I do not give anyone testosterone who is not willing to watch their nutrition and to exercise because it is absolutely useless if you don't put the three things together. It's like buying a Porsche and driving it 15 miles an hour in your neighborhood. You either do it or you don't, but the nutrition and exercise go with the testosterone therapy absolutely hand in hand. I agree, and to be cautious about how quickly you ramp up other activities such as sexual function. Absolutely. One interesting fact that I know you're well aware of that I always found fascinating is the fact that erectile dysfunction can sometimes herald heart disease. That is, you can get erectile dysfunction years before a heart attack. And what that tells us is the state of the pudendal arteries, correct? That is absolutely true. And it's so funny you mentioned that. You could have been my straight man at the lecture <laughs> today. Because today, when I put up the coronary risk factors, my last one is erectile dysfunction. And I think there's enough evidence now from the urological community that we need to consider erectile dysfunction as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. You're absolutely correct. The, my recollection of the data is that the pudendal arteries that feed the penis actually are a quarter of the dimension of the diameter of coronary arteries. So if you have inflammation, diabetes, heart disease, metabolic syndrome, a family history of heart disease, and that shows up on your radar screen at a relatively young age, like 40s, Absolutely. 30s, that's something that should be explored. You should have your heart looked at. It's a barometer for that. Absolutely, 100%. And like I said, you could have been my straight man today because I added that to my list of risk factors for the lecture. <laughs> Happy to help. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add that maybe you missed? No, not, nothing really other than the fact that testosterone therapy is safe, okay? But it's got to be done in the right hands with the right doctor and with the right monitoring. Because if you go out and try to get testosterone therapy with no medical monitoring, uh, not knowing where the testosterone came from, and not knowing what you're going to be doing with it, I think it could be absolutely detrimental to you. I think the FDA agrees with you because they came out neutral in terms of the heart. I think they were 
careful not to overstep their bounds, but they actually said there is no evidence showing that it's bad for the heart. Their major concern what was its unregulated use in effect, unmonitored use, overprescribed and undermonitored, I think is the best way to think about it. Absolutely true, and you're gonna see that today. Uh, when I go over the literature uh, that's out there, the use of testosterone, it's overwhelmingly in favor of having a positive effect on the cardiovascular system, and I mean overwhelmingly. But unfortunately, we get one bad apple, and then that tends to spoil everything for everyone. Yeah, that bad apple combined with the sensationalizing because it sells papers and Absolutely. news. That's where we had it. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. It's, it's a, pleasure, a pleasure, Caesar. Same, same here. here. Thank okay. You.